And we are live. Welcome back to the Two Turtle Tom live show every Thursday night, 8 p.m. We talk about turtles, exotic animals, wild places. And tonight I have an amazing guest, uh, my friend. I've gotten to know Paul Bodner really well uh, after moving to Northeast Ohio recently. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invite. You are welcome. And, you know, we, we've got to talk uh, about a lot of different things. And you really have worked with a lot of different animals, are currently working with a lot of different animals. You've been really all around the world. You're, uh, uh, you work for the Cleveland Zoo as a zookeeper and one of the most inspirational places of my young life, the rainforest. Um, and so why don't you, uh, how do you describe yourself to people? Well, I'm very um, pleased to be here and thank you for the invitation. It's it's an honor and, and it's very, very humbling. Um, I, I had a very natural inclination and and uh absorption of animals of all sorts very early on where i describe it as having born with a specific talent some people at age five can play the violin and from a very 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 early early uh, time in my life i i had i had animals attracted to me uh, very five years old, my brother got a parakeet for his birthday. The parakeet bonded with me within a day. And my mom and dad had to say, my brother, Matt, we, we've got to go out and get you another birthday gift, which he was actually happy to have something different. <laughs> so, so I had a, a beautiful little parakeet on my shoulder at five wow. years old. Wow. And, and, and I somehow just have a natural fluid relationship with all sorts of animals wow and that was the nurture part very very early on seeded and i was at the right environment like the animals on the galapagos islands they're in the perfect environment to have a, a nature a nature and nurture um experience i'm sorry the first was nature the second was nurture i got in in 1981 at six years old with NOAA, the Northeastern Ohio or, or, uh, Association of Herpetologists. I was the youngest member of NOAA at six years old. Wow. And uh, those World War II vets that were running NOAA at the time really took me under their wing. And although I was a, probably a bratty little kid to many of them, they, they really allowed me to grow in the animal world, specifically the reptile world, my uh, family is prone to allergies, so dogs and cats Ooh. were difficult. <clears throat> but the reptiles were fine, and my mother and father um, were all kind enough to give give space in in having first a turtle, then a snake, and then an iguana, and and this was all in, by ninth, by third grade. So There's I had a very um, Double double hit of of creatures and people that allowed that to blossom and grow. That that sprout grew into a sapling, which grew grew into a tree, and 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 continues to grow. And so, it at fifty years old this year, I, I can say I'm I'm happy to be alive. There's there's been some near death experiences, and I struggle. Uh, occasionally with reoccurring uh, septic infections from mosquito bites uh, while I was remotely in the Solomon Islands. But long story short, it's it's a real enthusiasm for life. It's a vitality for life. And, and I see things differently than most people do. Uh, but that that path has been has been a very, very good good way to to live fantastic wow that that's absolutely amazing it's a great introduction and i'd like to welcome everyone that joined us 
uh, in the chat and are watching from home. So if you're new here, please let us know your name and uh, what's your favorite exotic animal to keep. Let us know. Um, but who, we've got David Butler from Florida. Chris Richard is here. Patrick Lee. Hard Shell Herps is here. Uh, CNC Tortoises, that's Mike out in Vancouver Island. Phil Simpson was my guest last week. Phil is a turtle guy. He's a member of the Mid-Atlantic Turtle and Tortoise Society. Mikey Ben's up in Ontario, and Elva is joining us for the first time. She's one of my Hinchback buddies. So thank you all for joining us. And if you've just listened to that amazing introduction uh, from Paul, I, I think we're in, a, uh, in for a real treat. And if you have any questions for Paul, as we go along, just put them in the chat. Uh, we're going to have a great conversation about some of his adventures and some of the animals that he has worked with. And Paul, let's start off by talking about crocodilians. Thank you. Thank you very much. My favorite animal by far. Uh, in fact, uh, see if I can show you my scar, my recent scar. Wow. <laughs> that, that that's kind of the uh, uh lucky lucky scar crocodiles bite three different ways one's a warning bite second is a bite and shake and the third is a death roll the death so, roll yeah it was just a warning but uh back in uh uh almost 20 years ago now uh back 17 years ago to be exact i was invited by one of my heroes in life dr graham webb I was invited to become part of what's called the IUCN Crocodile Specialist Group. Oh. And and that's an appointed membership. And, and that group is a variety of stakeholders, roughly 300, that include scientists, teachers, conservationists, all sorts of uh, people that maybe are working in the skin trade. And Ooh. they look at crocodilians as a whole now there's about 27 species dna work has added a few species in recent years they look at management they look at conservation they look at human uh conflicts with crocodiles as crocodiles can be man eaters they look at conservation in um the skin trade are things sustainable can can they be managed in in, in a way that say is a crop and the CSG, the Crocodile Specialist Group, meets once every two years in a different country. This year it's in Darwin, Australia next month. And it's a, it's a group that's passionate about crocodiles, a, a family of animals that most people aren't real familiar with. A lot of people aren't even really like, to be honest. <clears throat> but uh, we look at them as, as, an, an, as a link to the past, as truly an archosaur, uh, very fascinating life history, biology, medical uses with their blood. Uh, they're finding mm -hmm. all sorts of uh, benefits in terms of um, uh, the pharmaceutical industry. So, mm -hmm. so my first and foremost interest has always been crocodiles, and and uh, it 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 started in about 1989 in high school. My dad said, what do you want for Christmas? I says, dad, the guy down the street has a three foot alligator for sale. He says, you're not getting an alligator, pick something else. I says, well, I don't know, maybe a, maybe a saltwater aquarium. I look under the Christmas tree and sure enough, there's a big 200 gallon wrapped up box. And I think, oh, I got a saltwater aquarium. Yeah. Sure enough, that was a fiberglass tub that my dad loaned and it had, it had the three foot alligator in it. Wow. That alligator. That's an awesome dad. Yeah, that's an awesome dad. My dad is ter terrific. He worked for the Department of Defense uh, for 30 years, and then he taught college mathematics uh, at a couple of the different colleges here part-time. And uh, awesome guy, still alive. They're doing well. They own a farm out in Hearts Grove. Awesome. My mom um, uh, worked at the Cleveland Clinic. She managed one of the, the, the Westlake Cleveland Clinic for, for years. But my mom and dad, I, I have two brothers, and they – they really, really didn't stamp out that interest. And they said, you know, if if he's smart enough to, to know what he's doing, we'll have some rules, you know, no venomous, no giant constrictors. But uh, yeah, and they said, well, let's just start him small and, and give him some parameters. And that really uh, just kept fueling the energy. Uh, as, as I was going to Cleveland State, I was invited to 
uh, become a zookeeper at the Cleveland Rainforest for seven years, taking care of all of the animals on the first level. The rainforest is a, a two-acre building indoors. At the time in 1988, it was uh, 1988, 1989, it was completed, and it was a $30 million cost to, to the city of Cleveland. The rainforest on the first level has a lot of the reptiles, and I took care of, while going to Cleveland State and studying, I took care of all of the animals on the first level that was mostly reptiles. It included the tortoises, the turtles, the crocodilians, the snakes, the lizards, orangutan on top of the floor, which was nice. Okay. And, and I had a very, very broad uh, responsibility of a huge variety of reptiles. Very we cool. had about 70 different species there. Some very rare, like uh, two Komodo dragons. Others fairly common, like the panther chameleons. Mm. And and I got to learn over that seven years, not not to be focused in, in one group. You know, you go to the, some of the reptile events and you see everybody's got ball pythons and others, everybody's got chameleons. I, I had to learn early on, and this was before the internet uh, mm. took off. This was certainly before... Uh, the, the the reptile shows yeah. and everything. The, I, there I was, was really no community back no, then. No, there there really was that you you learn from other people with experience and you flew to places to learn what other people were doing. You, you took that knowledge and you brought that back. Mm -hmm. So in mm -hmm. in um work working working at the Cleveland Zoo and going to school full time and making the dean's list. I was I was always a very good academic student. I, I got a uh, biology and business degree simultaneously. So I went to school for about seven and a half years at Cleveland State. The uh, the, the the spare time I had was spent with animals. I don't think I went to a single party in college. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit shy by nature. You wouldn't believe that, but I'm actually much on the introverted side than the extroverted side. Uh, but I in, at, in 1992 and, and 1993, I was hatching out American crocodiles at the Cleveland Zoo. We, we would get 25, 30 eggs, and, and I'd be incubating them at the zoo and hatching them out. And on a, on a Friday night, I'd, I'd be with Jonathan, the orangutan, you, you know, giving them a little bit of extra treats and uh, being at the zoo till 8 o'clock at night, some nights when everything was quiet. Uh, except for the frogs singing and very cool. and the animals moving around, so it was a very it was a very magical time to to be to be in that zoo field. Oh yeah, and I mean I I remember when the building was being built and it opened. What what do you think it opened? Eighty eight is that one? Yeah, it was it was it was nineteen eighty eight. I believe it was it was either eighty eight or eighty nine. So um, I was ten. Okay. And and I mean that whole building really helped set my direction too. And oh. and yeah, you were yeah. you were working there. Yeah, and, and and our connection is is wonderful, Tom, that the three radiated male tortoises that you have at the botanical gardens at the arboretum. Yep, yep. Those are the exact tortoises that I took care of for seven years. Yeah, that is so and, cool. And we've talked about it. I've got two female sub adults that are almost ready to lay eggs and who knows in a they'll outlive us but in a couple of years i think that connection of the tortoises that you take care of were the same males that i took care of and now eventually maybe these females we can get on breeding loan to you guys and 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 make baby radiated Amen. tortoises together yes absolutely that'd be awesome we are working hard on it and uh you know we are a plant-based organization uh so there have been some challenges, but yeah. I haven't given up on that ball. And and reptile people are patient. You know, we, we are patient, thinking, especially we turtle people. Five, yeah, five to ten years. Yeah. Um, and, and if it's 20 years out, it's like, well, that's probably just going to give us better eggs. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's let's talk about some of your recent croc work. Um, I saw pictures of you uh, in the in the Florida Everglades last yep. year. Uh, you've been around the world looking at crocs, e even yeah. recently. So what kind of work have you done recently? Uh, there's there's a couple of tiers to the crocodile 
part of my life. Uh, one is uh, I was uh, one of two people in the country outside of a zoo that had CBW captive bred wildlife federal permits. I had them for the entire order of crocodilia. Wow. So the Fed said, hey, you can have anything you want. We'll write you the permit for it. And um, along with that, there were other species of Galapagos tortoises, radiateds, uh, blue, uh, Grand Cayman Island blue iguanas, Indian pythons, ha ham Hamilton eyes, uh, which I'll, I'll show the yeah, audience. I, I brought. Uh, oh, wow. It's a beautiful turtle. Wow. So nice. And, and folks in the chat, if you have questions for Paul, want to pick his brain about crocs, turtles, tortoises, reptile keeping, the zoo world, international conservation, uh, travel, uh, let us know your questions. We'll be happy to take your questions. So the, the, re the reason is that Florida, I work with the University of Florida. They call the PhDs and the professors and the grad students the croc docs. Yeah. And and I'm a little bit partial to the baby crocodiles. Um, yeah. I love I love the adults. I've worked with a lot of adult crocs like over in Australia, and 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 I adore adore adult crocodiles because they behave just like the babies. Hmm. The mannerisms are the same. The behavior is very similar. Yeah, they they become the apex predator. They kind of know, but but there's a lot of it's like a, a human child. That child at five years old. When you look hard, he's not too different when he's 35 years old. <laughs> but uh, we work with the University of Florida in the Everglades and the Florida Keys. We'll tag and mark and capture and release baby American crocodiles that are a couple of weeks old or just hatching out of oh. the eggs. Uh, so we'll, we'll monitor the American crocodile population I'll, I'll go down for the crocodiles. They'll, they'll monitor alligators too. But when I go down in the July to August, I'm specifically looking at just the baby American crocodiles and the eggs and the nests th throughout that northern Florida Keys, very, very south, south Everglades, like Flamingo Bay would be a, an area where we would go to and see the, the animals. Mm -hmm. And so we're monitoring that study, which is about 50, 50 years old. The, st the study started in the 70s, and it monitors the American crocodile population, which in Florida, that's the only place in the world where crocodiles and alligators uh, share the same uh, territory, the yep. same range. Mm -hmm. and, and because alligators are much more rare than crocodiles, and, and so there aren't many places where they overlap. Um, yeah, there's yeah. yeah, there's two two species of alligators, uh, the American alligator, and then there's a Chinese alligator. Yeah, it's only which, two. I knew yeah, the Chinese, I know the American, but yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, and the American crocodiles are uh, pretty gentle, given what a crocodile is. Oh, okay. ninety percent of their diet is fish, mm. and in the last two hundred years, there's never been an American crocodile death in the continental United States. They they do. Florida's the northernmost part of the range, so mostly they they are in the Caribbean and and Central America. They're they're more of a estuarine salty species. But there was uh, in the early 1800s there was a, a guy that saw a crocodile on a beach and he kicked it, and the crocodile was alive. He thought it was dead. Turned around and killed him. That was that was the only recorded death wow. in the United States of an American crocodile, and it kind of it kind of was human error. You shouldn't go kicking crocodiles on beaches. Yeah, oops. <laughs> it's, it's alive. Oh. Now, g give us a feel for the southern. How far south does the American crocodile go? And specifically, I'm thinking, and I know about all of these South American caiman species. Does the American crocodile coexist with those caiman species? They do. They go, okay. uh, their, their range kind of looks like an amoeba. So if Florida's on top, that's the northern part of the range, and then they go through the Caribbean, mm -hmm. Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, those Caribbean islands. They hug Central America. They they have the Morlets crocodile, uh, also in Mexico and Belize, uh, you know, on that Yucatan Peninsula. 
Uh, they go into Cuba. American crocodiles go into Cuba. They're interbreeding with Cuban crocodiles now mm. due to uh, Castro building canals. And now mm. you've got a mixed gene flow. And then they go down to, to South America. They, they have the Orinoco crocodile in Venezuela. But the American crocodile is found in the coastal regions of, mm. of that South American. Although, for the most part, they're, they're kind of within a, a, an amoeba shape okay. around that Caribbean area. Okay, really interesting. So I'm going to welcome a few other folks that have joined us since we checked the chat. We have Sean Fleming. Sean is one of my turtle and snake buddies. He lives down in Louisiana. Uh, Nate Fanger is here. Nate is, uh, he works at Kent State. He's the head track coach at Kent State. So he's local okay. to us here in Northeast Ohio. Uh, and M Mikey Ben is wondering how old the Indian spotted pond turtle is i believe that's probably about eight years old they were bred at the bronx zoo and and donated here i ended up getting uh donated all males and so if there's any of the listeners that have female indian spawn turtles go through tom and i'd be happy to send you a male on breeding loan and we'll split the kids 50 50 but you keep an extra one if there's an odd one awesome and then Panther Pallet, one of my chameleon buddies, is has joined us. And uh, Leo is here. That that's probably Leo, uh, our, our friend uh, in Northeast Ohio. So hi, Leo. Uh, working with box turtles. Thanks for joining us, Leo. We're having a blast. And Leo, let me know if you'd like to talk box turtles uh, sometime. Um, we started talk. We started off talking about Noah, and. Um, I was never a member of NOAA, but I was just a little too far away to, to come up to the meetings down here in Mike, Summit County. Leo Leo, and I have been friends for, for many years when I was just a little kid. I named my first iguana in his honor, oh, named wow. Leo, in, in 1985. And awesome. Leo lived uh, street over. And uh, yeah, I'd go over and, and be fascinated with his turtles. And yeah, Leo, Leo and I go back... Uh, decades and and is, he's a terrific terrific guy very when i was a kid he he was one of my inspirational people that Fantastic. that was kind to a, a child and and showed showed children you know showed how beautiful these animals were awesome oh P panther palette says uh she's a cichlid buddy too and then db exotics is joining us uh checking uh us out from SA is that South America, South Australia? It, it, it could be South Africa, San Antonio. Oh, maybe San Antonio. Yeah. Let us know. Let us know. Uh, South welcome, East Asia, welcome, maybe. Welcome to the show. Yeah. Let, um, okay. So crocodilians. I'm really interested in one of the crocodilian species that you've worked with because they kind of live in the same habitats of some of the hingeback tortoises. Mm -hmm that I like from Australia. And I didn't know a lot about them, but there's this incredible documentary on YouTube about, okay. I think a group, I think they're Dutch or something. They travel okay. into the Congo to look for the African dwarf crocodile, genus Osteolamus, that's at least how they pronounce it. Yeah. And and they were looking for different species, perhaps, to determine if, if the animals are subspecies or species. So tell us about the African dwarf crocodile. I think it's an incredible animal. I love that. I, I'd love to. There, there's actually now three species. Three. Now, the, the genus is Osteolamus, and uh, the species that most people are familiar with is Osteolamus tetraspis. Now, what that means in Latin and Greek, it means bony-throated, Osteolamus, bony-throated. Throated, interesting bony throated and then tetraspis means four shield which refers to the osteoderms that what's called the neutral bucklers on the on the back um on the neck wow so, cool. so when you see it when you see a dwarf crocodile it tra the latin name the scientific name translates to bony throated four shield wow now there's three species now they've dna separated two the west african and then there's another uh, like a broader snouted uh, variety. And then the documentary was on Osborne's dwarf crocodile, which is found 
in the very northeastern corner of the Congo. I, I am very uh, true and dear to my heart. They are my favorite animal, the dwarf crocodiles. Wow. I have two of the three species that I, I own. I, I own a lot of dwarf crocodiles. It probably say hoarding dwarf crocodiles <laughs> to most listeners. But um, I believe I own about 30 dwarf crocodiles. Wow. And and I, I run I, I keep my animals decentralized. So uh, the adults, uh, you can see the adults. Some of my adults are at those zoos, like the Brookfield Zoo, or you can go down to Florida and, and see them at uh, a few different of the gator parks. And I'll, I'll move them around a little bit. I'll, I'll hatch them. I'll breed dwarf crocodiles and actually hatch the babies, which could in itself be a whole nother podcast when you you know the eggs are ready to go because they start chirping to you. Wow. And and they'll go, ah, 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 ah. and and that's that's about the time you pip them out. 90 days, 87 days, 100 days, something like that, depending on your temperatures. Uh, the dwarf crocodiles are very, very special. I, in 1993, got the first dwarf crocodile, raised it. It, it did real well. I made a fatal mistake. It died of electrocution. I put a, mm. a water heater in there without a ground fault interrupter. Mm. Mm. It, 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 it died. I was heartbroken. I mean, it was like, it was like losing a, as any person, losing a, a loved pet. And I had a, a pen pal at the, at the time, a Dr. Gabler, who started the Fort Ricky Zoo in Rome, New York. And he was one of the only people I knew that had dwarf crocodiles. This is back in 1992, 1993. You know, again, we're talking... And the internet really wasn't wasn't something that that was you could find people. Mm -hmm. So we wrote we wrote handwritten letters to each other, and uh, he was a surgeon down in in New York or down in uh, Florida, but from New York. He uh, he and I were, were were fast friends. His family and I are friends. Uh, he had a stroke, sent me two dwarf crocodile babies, and then he committed suicide because of the stroke he didn't want he didn't want the mm. memories lost yeah so i took those two dwarf crocodiles and acquired others throughout the years but i i got those animals to breed and now we've got eight babies from those two original ones because dwarf crocodiles take 20 some years to really mature we're just starting the breeding and uh what i'll do is i'll uh, collect the eggs. I'll drive them to one. Of, I've, I've got different places all over the country. Yeah, I'm a little bit like Ivy. I, I spread my crocodile fingers, and and I keep a de decentralized collection because yeah. if I really consolidated it, we're looking at over 100 crocodiles, right? Yeah, we're yeah. looking at a lot of animals. Yeah, but but uh, but I'll incubate those eggs, or I'll I'll have somebody who knows what they're doing. Say uh, that's a, a zoo that knows crocs incubate the eggs and we kind of we kind of spread spread those animals around for breeding we don't really we don't sell them there there's no value to them because of the crossing the state lines but uh my goal is to always have dwarf crocodiles accessible wow in the united states can you can you talk a little bit about where they live in africa and the habitats they live and what their lives are like yeah, they absolutely uh, cross over to the hingeback tortoises. Yeah, totally. So they, they're a West African species. And if you look at Africa. Excellent. I love visual aids. Oh, oh no. Paul had an earthquake. Right, hold on. Yep. I'm, I'm here. Yep. <laughs> That's just. Uh... <laughs> we're, we're good. I love That's... visual aids. And that's why we do this live and it's visual so we have africa here yep although it's reversed but we get the drift. yeah it's going to be reversed so this is actually <laughs> we get the drift <laughs> yeah, like, yeah something's wrong but no it, yeah. yeah and i think that's because of the phone and the camera yeah yes yeah it reverses it so nigeria so is, yeah so this is actually west africa here yeah you've got your south africa you've got yep. madagascar yep. over here what, what we have is the dwarf, the dwarf crocodiles in West Africa are found yeah. in this region, region right here. like a Conexus and Rosa territory, the, the yeah, tropical absolutely. forest of, of Africa. Absolutely. So uh, I was in the Congo and Cameroon, 
wow. studying dwarf crocodiles. I still I still am active in Africa. Um, oh man! And and then I did go up in the Chad Africa. Wow! There's no dwarf crocodiles in Chad, yeah. but 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 yes, the um, the wild dwarf crocodiles that that I look at are are mostly Cameroon and and the Congo area, so, southern Cameroon. Yep. Um, the, the, and and this is kind of where the the two the newly described species kind okay. of kind of one is is found on one side and one's kind of found on the other side as they work out the DNA and then the northeastern part of the Congo uh, which used to be Zaire yeah, is yeah. is where the Osborne dwarf croc so they've they, they in, encounter that that ba that equatorial rainforest band they've got the large beautiful brown eyes they're they're a, a nocturnal species yeah yeah they, they they dig burrows like the Chinese alligators dig burrows they'll They'll dig burrows 20, 30, 40 feet. Chinese alligators can go maybe 80 feet um, underground. And, and they'll usually be found in pairs in, in the deep rainforests. Very, 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 very similar to how the Paleosuchus caimans uh, inhabit the rainforests of South America. Mm -hmm. So you, you could say that the dwarf crocodile and the Paleosuchus, the osteolamus okay. and the Paleosuchus, have a lot of almost convergent uh, parallel evolution. Okay. The 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 nests um, the nests are in the rainforest. They uh, typically will lay about twenty eggs. The, the babies hatch at about eight eight inches long. They're they're banded uh, brown and copper or brown and gold, and uh, the mothers will take care of the babies uh, up to a certain point. They're not quite as maternal as the American alligator are, but then they're also, they don't really neglect the babies like say the, uh, uh, say maybe like the, the false gharial or the Johnston's crocodile does there. They will take care of those babies probably about two years, I, I would think. Very, and then the babies good. disperse. Now we, we found uh, dwarf crocodiles like kind of like puddles a lot there. Uh, you'll find them in, in little, uh, what Australians would call billabongs. Mm -hmm. And and very slow moving streams, very uh, stagnant bodies of water. You'll you'll find them in uh, very stable, very stable environments. So they'll they'll have a nighttime drop temperature of about set to seventy eight degrees Fahrenheit, and a daytime temperature usually at about eighty three to eighty five degrees. So when you keep them in captivity, they 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 don't tolerate cold like the American alligator does. You, you keep them actually in the mid 80s and and the way you breed them is you, you can adjust the uh, uh site the the levels of the water in the enclosure wow to, to flood and then to have a dry season mm -hmm. and so if you if you move the the water levels that generally stimulates them to breed that's why for example we we breed them in at the brookfield zoo in chicago they've got a great african uh rainforest uh exhibit and those animals are kept pretty stable in the temperatures, and that's where that's where we get some of the best fertility in the eggs. Wow, really interesting. I mean, I'm just thinking of the parallels with Conixus homiana and Conixus arosa. So many people think about these things being from tropical Africa on the equator, so they'll put them at 95 degrees or something like that. Yeah. And Dwight Lawson, in his study of of homiana, at least. He found that their average temperatures was like seventy two mm -hmm. degrees, mm -hmm. um, and yep. so that that is it's this paradox. You know, you would think something from the tropics of of Africa, but man, the, the microclimates these things live in is just so different than what people think they live in. And but and you've experienced this. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Africa uh, in those regions where those tortoises come from, where the uh, the uh, dwarf crocodiles come from they don't they don't see 60 degrees and they don't see 90 degrees yeah, <clears throat> the, yeah. And, uh, six, we've had dwarf crocodiles die in florida i always i always uh, get nervous when i keep a dwarf crocodile in florida if they don't i say bring them in during the winter because they you get about a couple of days of low temperature 60 degree days yeah. and the animal dies really? and on the other circuit uh, on the other spectrum, 90 degrees stresses that animal out. Yeah, totally. I mean, it sounds so much like 
the uh, homes in, in in Rosa, and I mean they're from the same place. Oh, wow! Now, That's now they amazing. actually, uh, they, they actually, the dwarf crocodiles will actually eat the baby tortoises. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I, to, absolutely. I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I think they could probably eat some of the bigger ones too. Yeah. You know, um, and, not when they get huge, but um, life as a tortoise in the tropics of Africa is not easy. No, it isn't. No, oh, it well. isn't. Um, they're they're also eaten eaten by chimpanzees. They found. Yeah. And, you know, there's a, there was a great science paper on it. So. And and I, I hate I hate to be the bearer of bad news, especially with you, Tom. <laughs> um, fertility on dwarf crocodile eggs on the breeding fertility goes goes way up when you feed them baby turtles. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Oh my gosh! Oh wow! Because, because uh, when you look at a, a a giant saltwater crocodile or a giant alligator laying, you know, thirty to sixty eggs. And that and that alligator is six six hundred pounds or five hundred pounds. You know the calcium uh, in the eggs is pulled from the female, right? Yeah. But you have a, a thirty five or forty pound female dwarf crocodile. You know you're talking an animal four feet long, and and it lays twenty eggs that are the size of those alligator eggs. But yeah, that that depletes the uh, calcium uh, per body ratio differently in the smaller crocodilian. Absolutely. Oh, wow. That is awesome. <laughs> I must say, I think that is the fact of the year so far on the, yeah, on right. the live show. So let's uh, let's take a look and see who's joined us. Uh, Sodas Exotics, who Sam Shulman is saying that he needs one more bed filled for Turtle Fest. So <laughs> Ty Park's uh, Turtle Fest is coming up and Ryan and I are on the Let's Talk Turtles podcast are going to we're going to interview Ty. Uh, oh, for yeah. the upcoming uh, to talk about Turtle Fest. So uh, if you're going to Turtle Fest, uh, let us know in the chat. Um, KMS Reptiles LLC is here. Welcome, KMS. Thank you for joining me. And DB Exotics is Dirk Barnard. And Dirk was a guest a couple weeks ago. He works with South African tortoises. So he's inviting you. Uh, to come uh, take a look at croc species down uh, that way. Um, Dragon Thank Lair you. is here. Padraig, he's one of our regulars. Welcome. Dawson Lawler in Texas. He's been a guest before, and he's started up his uh, podcast recently about turtles. And uh, great job, Dawson. Keep it going, man. Um, Elva uh, was, is talking about the range of crocs is so vast looking. Yeah, crocs live all around the, the tropics. Um, in most places, um, quite a bit. Um, uh, Sean McZoo, uh, a.k.a. Sean McNeely, is also here. Uh, he does a live show Wednesday night at 8 p.m. He just got back from Tinley. <laughs> uh, and survived it. Absolutely. Panther Palette says, I just stopped by to say hello, but I can't leave. I can't stop smiling. This is such a fun interview. Very interesting also. So Phil Simpson says he will be at Turtle Fest. So excited. So Turtle Fest is going to be a great event. I'm really excited for it. I'm not going to be able to go. My wife and I are actually going on a cruise the following weekend. So I can't be in Florida two weekends in a row. But uh, um, well, Ty, Ty and I are very good friends. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he's terrific. He's he's such a such a wonderful person. Totally. Mikey, Mikey Bensai says he loves your energy. Hard to think hey, of any stories and your story or uh, hard to think of any questions and your stories are awesome. Okay, Paul. So let's talk about snakes. Okay. Yeah. My second love, uh, snakes. And, um, there's a large collection of snakes here, probably a little too large, but, uh, <laughs> But I, I try to focus on um, snakes, and I find I can't focus on snakes because they're all they're all great, right? Cool. So one of the upcoming um, may, may be a secret, and and this will be the first time I'm sharing it here. Is um, I'm going to work with uh, one of the zoos in Florida on uh, potentially head starting eastern indigo snakes, and then releasing them back into the wild once they get to be teenagers. Um, mm -hmm. So that's in the works as of a couple of months ago. Awesome. I've got a huge snake collection. And, and because snakes are easy, you know, relatively speaking, 
I, I, I work with the Drymarkron, the indigo snakes, the Kribos. I've got ringed pythons currently. Uh, I've got eggs incubating right now in the incubator. I checked them about an hour ago. Uh, Indian pythons, Sri Lankan pythons, locality green tree pythons. Um, boy, what else is there? There's Burmese. There's uh, black milk snakes. There's hog island and insular boas. Uh, Dominican red mountain boas. I breed those quite a bit. Cool. Puerto Rican boas, Caribbean uh boas in, in some of those Caribbean islands. So uh, snakes are a, a hot mess. Uh, just they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're wonderful. They're heartbreaking. Uh, I don't get attached to the snakes like the, I do the crocs, but I've, I've always been a crocodile and snake cool. kind of guy. And then yeah. the turtles and tortoises, we've got fly river turtles here. We've got uh, radiated tortoises. Uh, I've got Galapagos tortoises. Uh, so they're, you, you know, from that Cleveland Zoo experience where where that was the that was kind of the 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 root and the soil, Cleveland Zoo, crocodiles, snakes, turtles and tortoises and lizards. Yeah. Yeah. I had I had to learn all all of them and and even tuataras um, offsite. Wow, super awesome. Uh, what an amazing experience and collection. And of course, you've traveled. We talked about going down to Florida. We talked about you, your travels in West Africa, the Congo, a very difficult place to visit and travel and, and do work. But you've been all around the world. Whoa, whoa, what's that? So, so outside of reptiles, I'm going to show you these. These are Goliath birdwing butterflies. Wow. And I'll show you um, another set of butterflies here. This is, uh, these are another group of butterflies. Wow. Are these ones that you've personally collected? Uh, these are ones that are sustainably bred by oh. villagers oh, wow. in remote jungles and they can they can grow the food plant they can breed the butterfly treat it as a crop harvest it and each each of those butterflies those villagers can sell for more money than it would they would get chopping down 10 rainforest trees from from logging companies so wow. each each butterfly uh, helps to sustain the rainforests and it's a harvest it's a harvest crop for butterfly collectors that allows them to get an income and and not sacrifice the rainforest uh, trees to be cut down I mean the examples of that is incredible and they're they're out there right we can we can use wildlife and we can conserve natural spaces at the same time uh in, yeah. in, in the turtle world i think it's tough because turtles live so long they're they're not very fecund and and people just love them to death so you you know yeah. you just have people plucking turtles when wherever they yeah. are and we, we just had brian horn on um from wcs on the let's talk turtles podcast and he was I'm like, we're like why if people breed tons of turtles why are people still taking them out of the mm -hmm. wild but, and selling them. And, and they're saying because they can, uh, you know, th there's no expense there, right? But um, it, it, I love hearing about examples like these butterflies where they're using the wildlife but conserving it at the same time. Yeah, so Mikey, Mikey Ben has a question. Are oh, okay. butterflies harvested in large numbers? They're, they're uh, Mikey, they're regulated by CITES. Uh, the Convention for the International Trade in Endangered Species, they're regulated. They're not rare, but uh, they do have a quota, uh, which allows uh, so many out per year. And yes, uh, large numbers being several hundred in many cases are allowed out as, as ex pupa specimens. And Tom, to get to your point, um, the whole IUCN crocodile specialist group 
one of the main philosophies is sustainably using wildlife to yeah. uh, make it a renewable resource as, as uh, it can affect communities and people and stakeholders. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, if, if, if the animal has value, it's, it's less likely to go extinct and more likely to be preserved. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, absolutely. It's man. People just really love turtles. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll, I'll give, I'll give you a, a, an upcoming, an upcoming adventure coming. I, you know, okay. Yeah. 25, 25, 27 countries around the world, wow. but in uh, New Zealand, New Zealand is coming up this year and, and that's a pure vacation minus going to see wild tuataras. We'll talk about that after I find them. But <laughs> the really exciting trip next year is I got invited uh, with the Nature Conservancy to go to the Solomon Islands again. This will be the third trip to the Solomon Islands. And there's a group of islands called the Arnavant Islands. It's a world heritage site because it's the only place in the entire world where the leatherback, the hawksbill, and the green sea turtle nest on these islands 365 days a year. Wow. Only uh, the government of the Solomons only allows a certain amount of people onto the islands at any time. Let's say it's 30 people at, at most. And what we'll do is we'll monitor the leatherback nests as they go down to the uh, ocean or the hawksbill or the green. But if you if your uh, viewers want to YouTube some great videos, look at Solomon Island Sea Turtle Islands. You could type in Arnavon yeah. Islands. And uh, there's some great little 20-minute uh, YouTube documentaries where all three of these species congregate 365 days a year, 366 days if it's a leap year, and they and they nest, and you can you can uh, watch these little babies go down to the to the ocean. Oh man, I yeah, that's a dream. <laughs> you that's know the a dream. the farming, and you may know this: the farming of sea turtles happens around the world. But uh, the challenge is the leatherback, right? The, mm. the leatherback um, has that uh, magnetic um, magnetic uh, sort of tracker like sharks do. That's why you can't keep a great white shark in an aquarium is because it'll keep hitting the walls till it dies. Huh. And the leatherback sea turtle has that same, uh, call it affliction in captivity. Oh. Leatherbacks can't. They can't be farmed like the other, like the green or the loggerhead or the hawksbill. Um, they can't. They can't keep those babies from wanting to keep hmm. hitting the walls. Hmm. So head starting is not an option for for those either. Head start. Yeah, leatherbacks are a challenge. Wow, a real challenge. Of course, leatherback is the biggest turtle in the world. Uh, can get eight feet long and weigh thousand plus pounds oh, we, man. We, we see them nesting in the solomons i've got some photos i've posted oh, online that's awesome. and, and 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 they're they're other world otherworldly it's you know there's a few things you see in life when you see the basilisk you know run across the water for the first time or flying fish or or the uh phytoplankton the phosphorescent plankton when you see a big leatherback on a black sandy volcanic beach laying her eggs at two in the morning you you never forget the size and immensity of that turtle incredible that's that is absolutely incredible um Patrick is saying that project piaba is another example and ryan and i have talked about that where uh, tropical fish growing and, and harvesting in the amazon is done sustainably um, super cool. So, Paul, wh one of the things that Ryan and I have been talking about on the Let's Talk Turtles podcast is the intersection of conservation and her herpetoculture, or herpetoculture, however you might say it. And your your life has weaved in and out of both of these worlds. Um, you've done active conservation. You've sat on the IUCN specialist committee. 
uh, you're also involved in lots of herpetoculture efforts. And a lot of times uh, uh, we see private keepers um, and, and people actively involved in conservation kind of butt heads sometimes. And how can we, how can we better work together and, and navigate uh, our differences? Because you're doing both. You're living in both worlds. Yeah. Do you have any advice or tips or thoughts on that? It, 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 it's usually attitude. It's the dissolve the ego. Uh, take the approach of always being a student, always learning. H how can I help? What what can I do to help? Uh, do you need um, you know Do you need a little bit of funding? Can I can I ferret away eight hundred dollars a year and send some uh, somebody in Cuba or Jamaica? say some snake sticks or flashlights so when they go out looking for snakes or turtles they don't step on a fertile ants or viper so you you, you find uh at very baseline sometimes what what can you just do to help and yeah. and it's a, it's an evolutionary process and some lead to dead ends and others others go extremely far i i've given thousands of dollars to help this um puerto rican butterfly with the I, uh, the Fort Worth Zoo and and I got together and uh, we we gave U.S. Fish and Wildlife about ten thousand dollars in a year to study this tiny little butterfly that looked like a quarter of a monarch in size and they were upset uh, assessing Fish and Wildlife was assessing whether this butterfly has to go on the endangered species list or or it's just locally rare or uncommon or hard to find mm -hmm. and butterflies are hard to hard to get a gauge on that because they're seasonal and they fly up and they fly down and, but um, so uh, it, it, it can, it can go in many directions. And as you, as you evolve into, into some of these areas, you pick and choose your battles. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a, I'm not a guy that really wants to go out and spend a lot of energy on in, in efforts uh, working with a panda bear because I'll never get anywhere. And, and honestly, a, a, a panda probably, should have gone extinct um based on their their biology and 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 their life you know things go extinct yeah every everything yeah. has has a, an end everything mm -hmm. dies um it's just the the way the world works but uh something like crocodiles in australia i can do that i can learn enough and and in the beginning you're not expected to learn you you just you are expected to help Mm. And if you do that, you start to you start to snowball, and and it's a resume. You you, you get one under your belt. Try to get a second one yep. under your belt, and and yep. before you know it, you, you've got a list of eight things in in twelve years. That's awesome. That is awesome advice. Well, Paul, that that is amazing. Um, is there anything you'd like to leave our listeners with? Uh, one last story, advice, recommendations. Uh, yeah, what, 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 what didn't I ask that you'd like to share with us? One, one story is, um, is, is never forget the humanity of what you do. There's, there's a lot of opportunity to, to, to make other people's lives better than, than your own. You know, we live in a very wealthy country and wealthy society. And it doesn't take much when you're in Africa or even when you're in Cleveland to nurture other people and to share. Don't, don't, don't let that ego supersede a common ob objective and a goal. You know, we're, we're in life together. If you can, if you can mentor somebody young, if you can uh, give some guidance to somebody or or help somebody you you're obligated as a human being to to make that effort and and the wildlife conservation will fall into place but it's it's about the people and the decision making and and know that the wildlife is is sometimes the side b of the album it's it's to improve mm -hmm. those people's lives first and that wildlife will, will follow suit. I've seen it everywhere. Mm, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much. 
this was Thank just you. a taste. We, I, I was telling Paul about the ultra long form podcast, and you know, maybe maybe one day I'll convince Paul to spend like six hours <laughs> with me. Uh, but for now, uh, we're gonna call it a wrap. Uh, call it a night and and wrap that. Thank you so much, Paul. That was awesome. I'm really looking forward to working with you more. Uh, radiated tortoises and uh, whatever we can do um, uh, together. And I, I think there's there's a lot of possibilities. So thank you so much. Thanks everyone for joining me in the chat. Thank you for all those, everybody that joins me at 8 p.m. I try to bring you interesting things and interesting people. And uh, Paul, you are an interesting person. So thank you so much. Um, Thank thanks, you everyone. Much. Thank you. All right. Goodbye.